know is campaign influence um, and getting to the marketing metrics that matter. Oops, there we go. Um, not gonna spend a ton of time talking about my company, but just to give you um, a little bit of background on who I am. Um, I've worked with Salesforce and Pardot for about 10 years. Um, I've worked hands-on in Salesforce since about 2009 um, and Pardot since 2010. Um, I own a company called Circante and have a blog called The Spot for Pardot, but we specialize in helping marketing teams be successful on the Salesforce platform, um, integrating complex processes between Pardot and Salesforce, um, and building out uh, custom solutions using the Pardot API. All right. So, um, Yuan and I were just talking about this before this started, but the word campaign in the Salesforce ecosystem is a little bit nebulous because you can be talking about Salesforce campaigns, Pardot campaigns, which are still two different things. Uh, you can just be talking about marketing initiatives in general. Um, so bef before we jump into the content, I wanted to do just kind of a quick show of hands of who's in the room um, so we can tailor a little bit to what you guys are looking to get out of this. So show of hands, um, Folks that are using Salesforce, who who's a current Salesforce customer? Okay, so pretty much 100%. Um, believe it or not, at some of the other Dreaming conferences, they I see like a small, maybe 10% contingent of people who are just curious about Salesforce or maybe looking at a career shift of some kind. Um, so that's good to know. Um, what about marketing automation? Any Pardot users in the room? Okay, so about half uh, marketing cloud. All right, some double hands there. Um, other marketing automation platforms? What platforms, out of curiosity? MailChimp, HubSpot? Okay, any um, Eloqua Marketo in the room? Okay, so lo lots of representation here. Anybody not that does not have a marketing automation platform or an email marketing platform? Okay, so three people that might need to go shopping after this. Um, and then in terms of the roles that are represented here, who does marketing automation as their primary job? Okay, so about 20% maybe. Who's a, primarily a Salesforce uh, admin or consultant? Okay. Uh, analytics and reporting as your main job function? Okay. Who did I miss? Product manager, you said? Product manager. Okay, gotcha. Developer? Any developers in the room? No? All right, so a good mixture of people. Um, so I'll try to keep this uh, presentation broad enough that there will be something that applies to everybody. Um, a challenge with all these talks is kind of trying to balance the theory and the practice. Um, I'm going to try to balance that out by including lots of examples, but um, please stop me and jump in with questions if you'd like to talk a little bit more about some of the nitty gritty details of some of this stuff. Sound good? Okay. All right, um, so the other working title that I had for this presentation was fucking prove it. <laughs> I didn't think that would get printed in the program though, so I stuck with the marketing metrics that matter. Um, and the reason why this is becoming such a big deal is date, more, more and more data is becoming accessible to managers, senior leaders. They're hearing the pitch from Salesforce that you can have a dashboard in the palm of your hand and wave Einstein or whatever they're calling it at any given point in time, that all that data is available to make actionable business decisions. But on the marketing side of the fence, there's still a good portion of marketers that still have this kind of Don Draper era philosophy of half of my dollars, half of my marketing dollars are wasted and there's just never gonna be a way to figure out where that's, where that's all going. Um, but that's not flying anymore. And this continues to become more challenging as the number of uh, potential marketing channels proliferates. So most marketing professionals have, um, they're on all the core social networks, they have a marketing automation platform, they may have a BI tool. Um, and then the challenge becomes how do you connect these disparate systems into one kind of cohesive customer journey and then connect the dots of the data as it flows through all these different, many different platforms. And this is an issue for, for many job functions. Um, but is particularly pronounced in the world of marketing right now. Um, and how this plays out, um, the, the lack of data and focus on ROI, 
I believe hurts marketing professionals when they're trying to get a seat at the decision-making table and are trying to get budget for doing the things that they want to do. Um, I, I should have put a source on the slide. I think it was Gartner that did this research. Uh, but they asked CEOs about their relationship with their, the members of their management team and how they felt about different positions on their team. 80% um, of CEOs said that they don't trust their own CMO. That's a pretty harsh number. Uh, the average tenure for CMOs right now is up slightly over a year. Um, so it's not working out super well. And by contrast, 90% said that they do trust their CIO and their CFO. So we need to move a little further towards that end of the spectrum. Okay, so the way that I've organized this presentation is basically walking through five strategies for better marketing reporting. Um, as I said, stop me if you want to talk about examples or get a little more into nitty gritty um, of any of these things. But uh, strategy number one, um, starting with the end in mind. So looking at with every marketing initiative that you're doing, asking the question, what is it for and what are you trying to accomplish? Um, these are many of the stats that I've seen um, my marketing team track, my customers track, um, things like visitors, page views, time on site in Google Analytics, social metrics for those platforms, open rate, click through rate. So there's a lot of things out there that can be measured. But behind kind of those, those metrics, um, thinking a little bit more broadly about like what is the core goal that I'm trying to do with this particular channel? So your goal on Facebook isn't to get likes, it's to build brand awareness and maybe drive traffic to um, a white paper that generates a conversion. So kind of backing it up and looking at what is kind of the macro level goal behind any of the tactics that you're doing um, as part of your program. Um, it's really easy for marketers to get distracted by vanity metrics. So numbers that, are, that make you feel good about what you're doing, but kind of obscure what the main purpose is that you're trying to achieve. Um, I gave this talk a few weeks ago, and on one of the feedback forums, someone told me that I had too many pictures of Derek Zoolander. I only have two. <laughs> I only have two, but this is the second one. So there you go. Um, but so with every metric that you're looking at, looking at um, does that demonstrate progress towards the goal that you're looking to accomplish? So um, the number one vanity metric that I personally still like to look at is um, the big traffic graph in the middle of Google Anal Analytics when you log in. Um, it's really exciting to see it move up into the right. Like, If things are going well, it's awesome to see that start to roll in and make progress. But if we're honest with ourselves, this isn't really a measure of performance. Um, it's really easy to game. You can run a quick ad campaign, make that number spike. Um, and at the end of the day, eyeballs on the website is not the number one thing that we're after. So an example of kind of how this comes into play. Um, so we were running a campaign for one of our customers, um, Facebook, Facebook versus LinkedIn. Um, Facebook ads were trending around 43 cents per click. Uh, we got 232 clicks, uh, really solid click through rate on some of our ads. Um, LinkedIn, on the other hand, we had less kind of top of the funnel results with. So really expensive. Has anybody done LinkedIn ad advertising here? It's so expensive. <laughs> uh, we're seeing between five and $15 a click for many of the campaigns that we're managing. Um, only 19 clicks on this one. So uh, not, not the best click through rate we've ever delivered. So if you look at these metrics alone, which campaign performed better? Yeah. So looking at these, Facebook is the clear winner. But then looking at like, what the next step in the process is, so the event registration page that we're driving people to, looking at what actually like, resulted in conversions, um, that Facebook number made us feel really good, like 232 visits, it's pretty solid. Um, but if it's not moving the needle on the actual goal at the end of the day, I put that in the vanity metrics bucket. Um, so kind of moving beyond that, that initial kind of the, the data point that's easy to gather and trying to look at um, one level beyond that. So instead of how many views did this blog get, looking at does engaging with blog content predict likeliness of a deal to close? Or instead of how many people opened this email, um, looking at how email marketing is impacting time to close, um, pipeline velocity. 
uh, in the actual metrics that mean that your company is making money. Um, and how many likes do we get versus how many leads we're getting from social and what we're actually uh, selling them at the end of the day. Um, another example of kind of where this vanity metrics thing comes into play is, um, so a strategy that we do with a lot of our customers is uh, when we send an initial marketing email, um, benchmark open rates across industries are around 20%. So there's 80% of the people on your list that didn't see the message for any given send. Um, we are, we're finding that if you send an email again 24 hours later to the non-openers, that you can still get a little bit more traffic. Um, in general, um, kind of our rule of thumb with that is to expect about half the response rate of the first send. So if you've got 20% on the first send, you're gonna see about 10% on the, the second send. Um, same with click-through rate. Um, and kind of a trade-off that, that we often look at with, with customers is, so like let's say this is an event registration example again. If the first one drove 117 event signups and then the conversion rate on the next one dips a little bit, but it still generates another 24 signups. The question is kind of, is it worth doing those second sends? Um, a lot of marketing teams will get stuck looking at the overall average and think, I'm not gonna do these resends because it's gonna pull down my average open rate and it's gonna look like I'm not doing my job very well. Um, and if you're incentivizing your marketing teams around those top of the funnel metrics, the, the data points that are easiest to grab, um, that's a behavior that you're encouraging. Um, but realistically, um, dragging down the average in this case, if it's continuing to generate leads, inquiries, registrations, whatever that call to action is, um, I would argue that that's something you should continue doing. Mm -hmm. on, on the are you talking about exactly the same creative, yep. same subject line? Same subject line, same creative. Um, or experimenting with the subject line if you don't want it to appear like threaded in the user's inbox. Um, MailChimp has done side-by-side -side studies of both, so resending with the exact same subject line and resending with it slightly different. Um, the exact same subject line performs a tiny bit better, um, but st statistically significant single digits. Uh huh. With these stats? Yeah, so honestly, um, I think people get so much email and they're so good at deleting it really fast that I think most of the time they don't even, it doesn't even register that they saw that message before. Um, which is sad that we have to pound people so hard until they, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit different timing, maybe catching a few other people. But yeah, there is a there's are many trade-offs to weigh there. Um, all right, any anything else on this one? Or should we move on to strategy number two? All right. Um, so, second strategy: asking the question behind the question. So, have have this, has anybody seen a demo of B two B marketing analytics in Pardot or Analytics Studio in general for Salesforce? The way that Salesforce is pitching it makes it sound like these, these dashboards, these pre-built dashboards are gonna be so easy to use and they're gonna have all the answers on your business. Um, they never, that never really becomes reality. Um, and even with customization, my perspective on dashboards is it's, it's not supposed to answer everything, but it's supposed to inspire further questions. So when you're looking at your data, like what are the outliers? What are the things that are different? What are some things that you can learn from highs and lows? Um, I also think a lot of um, interesting insights can be generated by comparing, um, like grouping opportunities together and comparing uh, differential results. So saying like, okay, group A, cannot read that on the screen, I apologize, it says group A. Um, but let's say group A engaged with blog content versus group B who did not engage with blog content. What is, what is the likelihood that an opportunity closes? What is the speed? Um, and trying to get some insights on um, how different groups of opportunities perform when they engage with different types of marketing campaigns. 
Um, another interesting point of comparison is just the industry at large. So looking for benchmarking data on um, how your opportunity metrics and how your marketing metrics compare to the rest of the population. Best place to find benchmarking data is to just Google it. Um, it shocks me how specific um, of benchmark data you can find with a little bit of digging. Um, a lot of industry associations and trade groups will put together some uh, benchmarking reports that can be really useful. Um, MailChimp has a really good study, SendGrid. Um, there's one other that uh, my team uses. But lots of awesome benchmarking. Okay. Um, strategy three, um, agreeing on the goals on the front end and then aligning your systems to support it. There's nothing more disappointing than wanting to run a report at the end of the year, looking back on performance and realizing that you could have gathered the data, but it's just not there. Um, so having some discussions with your team, with your management, um, with the folks that are managing Salesforce for your organization to talk about what are the reporting requirements, what's the reporting wish list, and aligning systems on the front end to support that. So standardizing data across Pardot and Salesforce or across your other marketing automation systems um, and ensuring that at every step of the process, what you need to capture is being tracked. Um, common culprits of messy data that I'm sure no one in this room has ever been guilty of. Um, freeform text fields, um, it's really easy to create one and slap it on a form, um, but if you're trying to use that data in any kind of actionable way, it's not super useful. Um, redundant custom fields between uh, Pardot and Salesforce or other marketing automation platforms in Salesforce. Um, endless pick list values. Um, we have a, a we had a, a client who's trying to manage their job titles in like category buckets, um, but a rogue list import uh, added basically like 200 or so uh, pick list values. So we're working on cleaning some of that up. Um, inconsistent pick list values is another uh, issue we see popping up. So maybe there's a restricted pick list in Salesforce and values are being added in Pardot, but they can't sync because they don't match up. Um, sales doing their own list imports is another way that we see data going down the toilet. Um, web to lead forms, um, who uses web to lead forms here? Um, okay, not that many people, um, but a handful. Um, one of the things that I love about Pardot is it uh, handles a lot of the deduplication that web to lead forms do not. Um, so something to think about if, uh, if you're still using those. But things you've all seen, but uh, easier to work with if you kind of set the clear reporting goals on the front end and then focus on getting your data lined up to support that. Um, and then thinking through every step in the system. So as your prospect moves from Pardot to other systems, to Salesforce, kind of what is every step that they're going through? Um, so looking at when uh, tracking cookies are dropped, um, if you're looking to get that level of analytics, um, how leads are created, when they're assigned, what the conversion process looks like, when sales gets involved, um, mapping all of that out to ensure that that's standardized. Also looking at what automation touches key data. So if there's a field that you depend on for reporting, um, working with your Salesforce admin or digging around in the back end of Salesforce to make sure that no other automation is touching that. Um, one that I frequently see being involved in rogue automation is lead source. So lead source getting overwritten. Um, some business logic was created at some point where that was a desired behavior, but down the road, uh, not as useful. And then once all the data is overwritten, it's really hard to go back and try to recover that. Has anybody seen an example of this that's interesting? Yeah, okay. Um, all right, this is the biggest one. So bringing it back to revenue in Salesforce, um, because with campaign influence and a lot of the reporting tools that are available, you really can. So the whole half my dollars are wasted thing, like I wanna banish that from the, the mouths of every single marketing person because there's a lot that we can do now to connect uh, marketing activity to um, revenue. Um, an interesting com conversation that kind of comes up when looking at revenue attribution is, um, I think a lot of marketers have the perception that uh, 
attribution is taking credit away from sales, and sometimes sales has that perspective too, but it's not really about is it sales or marketing that gets credit for this opportunity, it's about where are we investing our marketing dollars and what's actually moving the needle. Um, this is kind of the progression, I guess, of sophistication with marketing reporting. So the easy kind of low-hanging fruit, views, followers, uh, the things that Facebook and Google and native platforms give you right out of the box, that's kind of step one. Next level of sophistication, so measuring actual actions, so click-throughs, conversion rate of landing pages, number of leads that are generated. Um, but the goal that um, we, we work with our, our, the marketers that we work with, um, that we're trying to get them to is focusing on um, source revenue. So how many opportunities, what's the value of the opportunities that marketing is generating, and then what's the total uh, influence pipeline. So maybe you go to a trade show and you generate 10 new sales opportunities, but you run into 500 customers and prospects that expect you to be visible at that show, that the volume of revenue that's influenced by that um, is something that's worth taking into consideration. Um, how many people use Salesforce campaigns in here? Okay, that's awesome, like 70%. Um, we're seeing, I'd say probably 20% of the existing Salesforce customers that we start working with are using Salesforce campaigns at all, um, and about 10% using them in a coherent, useful way. Uh, so I'm gonna skip through some of this detail because it, uh, it sounds like most of us are pretty familiar with this, but I think campaigns are the most underutilized object in Salesforce. Um, the, the word campaign, I think, can be a hangup, so the substitute word that we use is initiative, so any marketing, sales, or internal initiative that you wanna be able to link back to revenue. Um, we've also seen people track customer service initiatives as campaigns, um, which getting into kind of the influence revenue territory um, could be a really interesting thing to try to measure. Um, so the way that campaigns link um, initiatives to revenue, um, so on the left here, um, if marketing is tracking their campaigns um, in a coherent way, uploading it to Salesforce, um, you could create campaigns for things like events, webinars, um, Google AdWords, uh, paid search, any of the different marketing channels that you're using on an ongoing basis. And then obviously sales, sales if they're doing their job, is logging and closing opportunities. Um, the way that Salesforce looks at this um, is putting the contact at the center of that to try to link those two sets of data together. So adding, sales adding contacts to opportunities as contact roles to indicate this person was involved in this deal. Um, and then on the other side, marketing working with the campaign member relationship and saying this contact or lead in Salesforce um, belong to these marketing initiatives. And those two data links are kind of the secret sauce to getting to being able to connect the dots all the way from this is what happened on the marketing side of the house and this is what actually led to closed one revenue. It looks so simple on a picture like this, um, but in reality we see um, like inconsistent behavior with creating campaign member records, so maybe some forms are creating them, some aren't, um, and then getting sales to add contact roles is, um, can be an exercise in pulling teeth if they're not already doing that as part of their day-to-day -day workflow. I'm seeing some heads nodding, um, some arm wrestling going on with sales over that, I'm sure. Um, let's skip that one. Um, but then the reporting that we can get to at the end of the day, if those data relationships are in place. So when an opportunity is closed, being able to say, these are each of the campaign touch points that influence this opportunity over its lifespan. So you can set your influence window, so X number of days before an opportunity was opened, um, all the way till the opportunity was closed. Um, this is a, a condo rental company that we work with in Georgia called uh, Escape to Blue Ridge. They, all of their, Cabins have like bear puns or like, this one's called decking around. Um, but we wanted to be able to track, um, so of all the email marketing that we're doing, which ones are more correlated with people actually going and renting a cabin. Um, the other view, so from the campaign, being able to look at, um, these are the influence opportunities and these are the things that this uh, campaign actually sourced. Um, and then kind of the, 
The next level of sophistication is starting to get into attribution. So Pardot, um, Pardot customers have access to four default attribution models. Um, so sales, the Salesforce model um, or the primary source model, uh, first touch, last touch, and even touch distribution. Um, if you are not a Pardot customer, you can still set those up. It just requires a little, um, a little, a few extra hoops to jump through. Um, and B2B marketing analytics is a Pardot bolt-on um, that lets you explore your data in a more interactive way. It's basically a partitioned version of Analytics Studio um, that's focused primarily on marketing data with some pre-built dashboards. Um, one of my pet peeves right now, um, I don't know if I should say this while this is being recorded, but I'm gonna go for it, um, is a lot of Salesforce account executives have the perspective that you need B2B marketing analytics to be able to do campaign influence reporting, and that is just not accurate. Um, campaign influence reporting takes place in Salesforce, and all that data is in Salesforce and can be used in a native Salesforce dashboard. So, um, pro tip if anybody's, if anybody's getting pitched on that currently by Salesforce. <laughs> Um, can show of hands on the Pardot users again? Okay, so we're roughly half. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this since it doesn't apply to everybody, but um, connected campaigns are kind of a hot topic in the world of Pardot. Um, so they beca became generally available in June of last year. Um, but historically, Pardot campaigns and Salesforce campaigns have been 100% separate. So um, Pardot campaigns were used to track the original source of the prospect. So um, the first initiative that basically brought them into your database. Um, whereas Salesforce campaigns operate a little more like the rest of the world thinks about campaigns where you can, it's one to many, you can be included in as many initiatives as your marketing team wants. Um, whereas Pardot was just the first thing that brought them in the door. Um, so with connected campaigns, um, it's basically one campaign to rule them all. So once you turn it on, you can no longer create campaigns within Pardot. Um, they need to be created on the Salesforce side and then they push over to the system. Um, but it opens the door to a lot of new and exciting reporting capabilities. Um, so when uh, connected campaigns is enabled, it creates new, I, it says custom objects here, but they're actually, um, new default objects in Salesforce that get turned on for list email, marketing forms, and uh, marketing clicks. Um, they don't show up, there are no reports that like spring to life or anything like that, but you can find them in the data loader and start uh, looking at some things there. Um, and you can also add uh, engagement metrics to your campaign page layouts. So tracking um, number, of, number of form fills, number of opens, number of clicks on emails. Um, is surfacing that at the campaign level in Salesforce, which sounds so basic, but we've never been able to do it with Pardot before. Um, I know Marketing Cloud has had some capabilities around that for uh, a bit longer. Um, another great thing about connected campaigns in Pardot is it lets you surface, 10 minutes? Okay. Um, it lets you surface summary level data at the campaign, roll, rolled up to the campaign. So out of the box Pardot, you can see averages across um, across your entire org, or you can download an Excel spreadsheet and look at things one by one, but there's not an efficient way of trying to group that. Um, but with connected campaigns, if you're linking multiple Pardot assets to the same Salesforce campaign, um, it lets you gather kind of metrics across that whole group. Um, and then having that data in Salesforce means that we can use uh, Salesforce reports and dashboards to touch it. So starting to visualize some of the things that in Pardot we've always had to uh, do in a, an outside reporting system. And then we can use list views and other native Salesforce functionality that, again, seems really simple, but is revolutionary from a, a Pardot perspective. Um, we'll skip over that. Okay, and so then the last, um, the last strategy, strategy number five, um, it's, I geek out over this stuff, like getting into the nitty gritty details of connected campaigns and how the campaign influence relationship works. I love playing around with that and looking at different possibilities there. Um, but when it comes to reporting, obviously knowing your audience and who you're reporting to is critical. So um, going back to what we were just talking about with uh, sales and kind of how they view the word attribution. So delicately rolling that out and framing it in a way that 
um, makes that seem exciting to them and not like marketing is trying to claim that they own 40% of my pipeline. Um, and then another, <laughs> another kind of reporting trap that I see is um, like somebody saying that they want to report once and then the marketing team creating that for the rest of their lives when whoever requested that report is either gone or stopped looking at it six months ago. Um, so continuing to check in and make sure, making sure that the reporting efforts that you're going through, going through are actually um, being digested on the other end. Um, and then thinking through what are their most important questions, what are their success metrics for their job, um, and how marketing can connect to that and support that. Um, so just to kind of recap a few of those uh, key nuggets. So starting with the end in mind, um, asking better questions to get to um, the real outcome that you're trying to measure, working on a vision of success on the front end so that you can configure your systems to support that, um, tying things back to revenue, um, using comparison between, um, between groups of opportunities to try to glean some insights, um, and then knowing your audience when it's time to report out. So that's kind of the, uh, my campaign spiel in a nutshell, but I uh, want to open it up to questions if, if you guys have any. Um, so many, um, <laughs> there are many. Um, the one that I see a lot is the Google Analytics connector can have a setting um, to automatically create campaigns based on Google Analytics campaign data, and it floods in a bunch of sales of Pardot campaigns that no one knows the origin of. Um, so that's one that we run into a lot, so definitely turn that setting off if you have it. Um, other kind of gotchas, uh, depending on how Salesforce campaigns have been used in the past, you might need to do a little bit of cleanup um, before that becomes super useful. Um, and you, you'll have to make some decisions about like how much, how much of your past data you want to try to connect versus just drawing a line in the sand and saying, from here on out, this is the new campaign structure that we're following. Um, also, if, uh, okay, two others. <laughs> Uh, one other one, if, if you have uh, prospects that are linked to an unconnected Pardot campaign, every single time you edit a prospect record, it will force you to update the campaign, which drives me crazy. So um, looking for the campaigns that have the highest number of members um, and updating those. There was one other and I just forgot it, but it'll come back to me, I'm sure. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So that's a big question um, that I don't know that anybody has a perfect answer to right now. Um, when Pardot moves fully on platform, from what I understand, there's going to be a new object created that's basically a, like a pre-lead object so that we can still report on it, but it's not kind of mucking up Salesforce's or sales's lead workflow. Um, but that's very much in the future and not something that's on the near-term horizon. So in the short term, um, if, if you can come up with a workflow that makes sense where you're pushing all of your, your records to Salesforce, we're doing that with a lot of customers. Um, the other alternative is using um, B2B marketing analytics because it can kind of reach into both platforms. But really, really good question. <laughs> Yes, so we, um, we've worked with a couple customers that that's their perspective. Um, in many businesses, that probably isn't entirely true, but if that's how marketing wants to measure it, you can write an Apex class to automatically make those associations. And related to that, in terms of the campaign influence, the automated assignment thing, what's the timing process on that? Which way around do you have to be, does the campaign happen first, or the, the contact role, or does it matter? So um, the, when the contact role is added, doesn't really matter. Um, when the person is added to the campaign matters. 
So when you're configuring campaign influence, you can say um, what that time window looks like. So if you, if you consider 90 days to be influential or anything that touched them for the last year to be influential, our kind of rule of thumb for that is like one and a half times the sales cycle, the average sales cycle. So if your sales cycle's a year, looking a year before those opportunities are, were created um, and measuring across the life of the opportunity. Um, if you want to like load past campaign data and start to use campaign influence reporting, you have to do it with backdated uh, created dates on the campaign members um, because the system has to be able to look at um, when was this opportunity created? When was this campaign member created to say, like, did this fit the rules of being in that time window? So time get, does get a little tricky there. But it's X number of days before the opportunity was opened until the, the opportunity itself is closed. Yeah, so there are two, um, two items that are lightning only that I'll show you really quick. Um, so engagement history, oops. This uh, related list is available only in lightning. It's basically a cleaner view prospect activity box in classic. And then also um, these summary metrics, this little lightning component, that's um, only available in lightning. But the underlying data for this is available in Classic, so you can show number of email opens, number of email sent, and you could theoretically create a formula field to show the same metric, but this component's only, only available in Lightning. So I would say it's still worth doing if you're in Classic, but a few little perks that are available in Lightning and not Classic. Other questions? Um, I'm not sure if they're posting it somewhere, but if you give me your card, I can send you a copy of this. All right, well, we are, it's 10.09, and I'm supposed to finish at 10.10, so that's pretty darn close. Uh, but thank you guys for coming, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to come chat with me or find me on Twitter. I'm at Andrew Terrell, but um, thank you guys all for coming. <laughs>